A blessed day to all. Welcome to our third message in the series of messages under the theme, This World is Not My Home. And today we will contemplate on the topic of love, not the world. Love, not the world, taken from 1 John chapter 2, verse 15. Let us open our Bibles to 1 John chapter 2. We shall read the passage starting from verse 14 all the way to 17. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2, verse 14 to 17. I shall begin. 1 John 2, 14. I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof. But he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Amen. Let us look to God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, our Father in heaven, we thank Thee for Thy precious Word. And we thank Thee, Lord, for every opportunity for Thy saints together as they meditate upon Thy Word and as Thy Spirit will work in their hearts to cause them to be convicted and to live according to Thy Word. We pray, Father, that our lead us to the meditation of Thy Word this day, that we may increase in our love for Thee, that our love for Thee may be kindled to cause us to want to serve Thee with zeal, with devotion, that, Lord, we may, as a sojourner, understand that we have this enmity with the world. For indeed, they that love God are enemies indeed of the world. And we pray, Father, that we will learn as sojourners not to love the world, but indeed to love the Father. And, Father, in heaven, we pray that thou will continue to be with us, lead and guide us, strengthen our bodies, Lord, even through this time of the pandemic, strengthen our minds, Strengthen us in the spirit that, Lord, none may be found slothful or negligent in this time that we are resting and working from our homes. Bless our time together, Lord. We pray and ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Now, the key verse, as we have mentioned today, is from verse 15 of First uh, John chapter 2, and it says, Love not the world. It begins with, Love not the world neither the things that are in the world. Now, what is this about not loving the world? And we must also know and understand that there is right, a wrong way of understanding this phrase, not loving the world or love not the world. And this wrong understanding leads to a falsehood, right, a false doctrine and a heresy. Now, how do we see that? Well, we know that in history, for instance, right, all the way back to the first century, there were groups around the Holy Land that were living out in the area, in the wilderness, right? especially the area that is slightly north of the Red Sea, in the area people have found or people refer to as the Qumran area, or the, these groups of people referred to as the Qumran sects, right? S-E-C-T-S. Right? They were religious. They were very conservative. They were, if you like, very fundamental in their belief and they shunned the world. They separated themselves from the world. Now, these people live a very uh, uh, a life that is very frugal, right? And they engage themselves in a lot of spiritual exercises, including physical cleansing, bathing, and all kinds of uh, spiritual exercises. And then, if we move on in history, sometime in the Middle Ages also, well, and the centuries before, there were those who practiced asceticism, right? They claimed that they loved not the world, or according to the word of God, they says, love not the world. So what did, they, what did they do? They separate themselves from the world. They will live in far away, remote hilltops. They will milk, build monks or monasteries, and these people will gather and live, and they live very frugal life, very sparse and very spartan life. And to them, that is the idea of not loving the world, of or their interpretation of not, right, to love not the world. 
Why do they understand it this way? Well, certain parts of the Bible does tell us, as we have just read in verse 15, love not the world. And if you misunderstand that, right, we could go wrong in the same way these people have. Or perhaps if you read some uh, writings of Paul, for instance, in 2 Timothy chapter 2, verse 3, he says, But thou therefore endure hardness as a soldier of Jesus Christ. And so some people are inclined to think, well, I must live a life right, of what great labor and great travail and enduring all kinds of hardship, sometimes self-inflicted, right? Self-inflicted hardship when you have all the comforts of life around you, but you deliberately right, shun them and you deliberately keep them away and suffer the weather, suffer the heat, suffer the sparseness of life. Is that the right way to look at the phrase, love not the world? Well, the Bible will tell us, indeed not. In today's meditation, we want to think about the sojourner. The sojourner, as he goes to this world, he loves not the world, but we want to understand that correctly in the light of God's word. And we want to understand it correctly in the light of our response to God. And in this way, I want to dwell upon three very important phrases. First of all, our love for God. A sojourner, as a sojourner, our love and affinity for God. That is of prime importance. Actually, that is the driving force for us not loving the things of the world. So initially and firstly, love and affinity for God. The sojourner's love and affinity for God. That's very important. And then we will go on to meditate upon how very important it is for the sojourner not to be associated with this world. Love not the world. Enmity with the world. Love for God and therefore separation from the world. And then thirdly, we will learn and understand how the Word of God teaches us about the permanent nature of our sojourn, about His Word, about loving His Word. Loving the God, loving our God, being walking a close walk with Him, loving God, not loving the world, finally, loving His Word. Let's look at the words of Scripture and be instructed. Let's begin with verse 15. Verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Now, the verse here begins actually with a command. The word love not is an imperative. So it's actually a command not to love the world. Right? We are commanded in the Bible in many places to love, which is positive. Right? Husbands, love your wife. That's something we need to do. Right? Thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, soul, and might. Well, again, positive, a very positive and a very pointed, a very clear directive you must do, command. You know, the Lord Jesus, when asked, what are the greatest commandment? What, what, which is the greatest commandment? And he said, Thou shalt love the Lord as the first. And then he went on to say, Thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, right? Shalt love. Again, command. So the Bible gives us very clear directives of what we ought to love. We ought to love God. We ought to love our neighbors. Husbands ought to love their wives. But here, when we come to verse 15, the imperative comes with a negative love. Not the world. Do not love the world. Do not love the world. Now, how and why does the Apostle Paul, uh, Apostle John, in writing this epistle, begins this message with that command? Well, to know, to understand that, we must know the theme that he is writing about and the message he's trying to convey to this uh, audience, the people who are going to receive his epistle. It begins with chapter 1, verse 3. Right? If you just go back one page from chapter 1, you'll see verse 3. And there John writes, That which we have seen and heard declare we unto you, that ye also may have fellowship with us. And truly our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. So he begins this letter by pointing towards two very important persons, God the Father and God the Son. 
Jesus Christ. And in Him, we have fellowship. We have that commonness of sharing and that commonness of communion. Right? This is the meaning of the word fellowship. And verse 4 says, uh, 1 John chapter 1, verse 4, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full. So that fellowship of the believer with God the Father and fellowship of the believer with God the Father and God the Son, our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, that continued fellowship and that bond of love, if constantly adhered to, right? if diligently sought after, if continuing in communion, what does it bring about? It brings about a very desired result. Verse 4 of chapter 1, your joy may be full. That your joy may be full. So this is our very first thought. Our very, very first thought. Before we think about not loving the world. Because we, mo- we will read, and John comes in verse 15 of chapter 2. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of the Father is not in you if you love the world. If you love the world, your communion and fellowship with the Father is broken. Because your love is no longer directed towards Him. Your love is no longer directed towards the Son of God, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. It's been misdirected and is now pointed towards the world. Our very first thought is our love and affinity for God. And this is where we want to dwell our thoughts upon. This is the message that the Apostle John is trying to write. Our fellowship is in Him. Our fellowship is with the Father. Our fellowship is with the Son. That bond of love that draws us together, that God lovingly takes us in. Though we were enemies once, now saved and atoned by the blood of Jesus, we share that bond of love. Can that bond? Well, what will happen if the believer or someone shuns that bond? Well, walking away or being out of fellowship, you will lose the joy. Because verse 4 of chapter 1 says, These things write we unto you, that your joy may be full, that you may fully experience and know the joy of being in communion with God. What a wonderful thing it is indeed to know and to understand. And why is this even possible? Why is it even possible that sinners can experience great joy? How is it even possible that sinners, sojourners on this world, may say, right, I have fellowship with God? Well, the Apostle John makes it very clear. Chapter 1, verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it, and bear witness, and show unto you that eternal life, which was of the Father, and was manifested unto us. So in chapter 1, verse 1, in the first four verses, when he talks about fellowship with God, fellowship with the Father, fellowship with the Son, he begins by telling us about how this life was given to us, or to them. And he's a witness of it. And he's a witness of that which he has, verse 1, he's seen, looked upon, and handled of the word of life. The ministry of the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ amongst his disciples was great cause for encouragement for the apostles to continue preaching that gospel message of salvation, that message of eternal life, verse 2. For the life was manifested, and we have seen it and bear witness. They saw the resurrected Christ. They saw and realized and knew, indeed, this is the Son of God. For He is a testimony of God's power to give and bestow life and resurrection. His very resurrection. He says, we have seen it, for the life was manifested, and we bear witness. In fact, the Apostle John, in the writing of his gospel, were to say what these things are written, that you may believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. Because they were witnesses of that resurrection. They were witnesses of that fantastic event, right? That is a demonstration of the power of God over sin and death. And then he says, verse 2 of chapter 1, and bear witness and show unto you that eternal life which was with the Father 
and was manifested unto us. So what does John begin with in this epistle? When we come and go closer to the passage that we're considering, John chapter 2, verse 15, love not the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. He had, when he started writing this epistle, laid out very clearly as a sojourner, as a man passing through this temporary world, this temporal world, what do we need to have? We need to continue in fellowship with the Father. We need to know and understand and to love God with all our heart, soul, and mind. Love for God, affinity for God. Because if you don't have that, then the love of the Father is not in you. If you don't have that salvation in the Lord Jesus Christ, what would happen? You would be lost forever. You would not enjoy that communion that God has given to all those that put their faith and trust in Him. So verse 2, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. It has been supplanted by the love for the world. So friends, brothers, sisters, let us know and understand this as we contemplate upon our love for God. God gave his only begotten son in order that we may be reconciled to enjoy that fellowship with him and that we may continue this walk on earth showing our love for him, living our lives for him. So let not, let not the things of the world set us back. There are things in the world that will set us back. Yes, in some instances, it may be the lack of provision. If in these very inclement times, in these times when perhaps people are talking about job losses, people are talking about business closures, some of us may have anxieties, may have that worry, where is my next paycheck coming from? But do not let those things of the world detract or distract you from your love for God and to continue to love God with all your heart and soul and mind. And it may not be something in the world that has to do with your career or your provision. It may be something in your personal life, a relationship, for instance. And you may have seen and looked around you, and everybody or people around you, your colleagues, your friends, some of them are unbelievers, and you find that they are going right, and finding partners in their life. And you may have this feeling that you are left out. Do not be. Because God has a plan for every life, for every one of his children, every son and every daughter of God. I hear and know about, and this is becoming and gaining popularity, even among Christian circles, young men or young women will go onto the internet and look up dating websites. Now, some of these websites advertise themselves as what Christians, right? They are Christian websites for helping to connect Christians and to find partnership. I will give a very clear caution, be very careful be very, very careful uh, in these sort of interactions. There are scams, there are scammers. Right? And there is always that understanding for a child of God, a son of God, a daughter of God. Am I, in my demonstration of my love for God, walking in His will? And I think as a child of God, that is even more important than whether you fulfill right, the things of the world that people see and measure success like a good career, like having partnership or a family, or building a good business, whatever that may be, or developing yourself and, you know, heaping on, upon yourself academic qualifications. Those are things of the world. For a believer, one whose faith is in the Lord Jesus Christ, the first and prime importance, love for God. So this is our first point that we want to know. The sojourner, as he walks this life and he walks this world, love for God. Very important point. Secondly, the verse tells us, 1 John chapter 2, verse 15, makes it very clear. Those who say they have fellowship with God, well, the love of God would be in them, isn't it? 
Wouldn't it be? 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. The love of the Father in, is not in him. In fact, John, prior to this, makes it very clear to the readers of his epistle. If you have no fellowship with God and you walk in darkness, which is a clear sign that you have no fellowship with God, if you continue to be a drunkard, if you continue to cheat or lie at your place of work, if you continue to engage in sexual sins of all kinds, including pornography, including all kinds of sins in the world, if you continue to walk in the ways of darkness and you say you have fellowship with God, then the Bible says you are a liar. In fact, John writes it and he makes it so clear. Verse 5 of chapter 1, 1 John this then is the message we have heard of him and declared unto you, that God is light and in him is no darkness at all. So anyone who is in fellowship with God should shun darkness. Now, I don't mean sinless perfection here, and I will clarify that in a moment. But in him is no darkness at all. Verse 6 goes on to say, If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. We do not the truth. So when verse 15 of chapter 2 right, stands out and declares to us, love not the world, neither the things of the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. John is making a very clear stance on what he had already said. And what he has said is this, if you live a life that doesn't exhibit that close fellowship with God, if you live a life that seems to have these, right, cloud of darkness around it, and darkness here refers to, he will clarify, sin. Sin. Yes. If a man or woman claims to be in fellowship with God and continues in sin, this man is not in fellowship with God. He's a liar. Verse 6 says, if we, if we say we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. Our deeds, our conduct, is not in keeping with the truth of God. So a sojourner, one who is a temporary resident on this earth, does not love the world, does not love the works of darkness, and he treasures his fellowship with God. He treasures the love for God and continues in love. Now, I said earlier, this is not making a point about sinless perfection because as long as we're in this flesh, we know, right, we are prone, right, to temptation. We are prone sometimes to weaknesses and we do fall. John is not talking about that. And we know that because of his writing. Let's read on. Verse 8, if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. Verse 9, if we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So, the opening verses of John chapter 1, verse 1, when he talks about fellowship with God and that continuing fellowship and the display of that fellowship is seen in the man or the woman who walks in the light. His life is not clouded by sin. It is not a call to live or to be sinlessly perfect all your life because we know as long as we're in this flesh, that will be our struggle. In fact, Paul even writes about that very explicitly, how he struggles, Romans chapter 7. Right? That which I would, I do not. But that which I would not, that I do. Does the word of God give us an answer? Certainly. I have just read it. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So the sojourner's journey on earth, though not sinlessly perfect, though exhorted to live a life and demonstra in demonstration of love for God, he has, by the atoning work of the Lord Jesus Christ, have a means by which he may be sanctified, he may be forgiven of his sins. How? By coming in humility and submission 
asking God for forgiveness. So we come, the full circle that John is writing about, all the way back to verse 1 and 2, that which we have witnessed, the life that was manifested, the atoning work of Jesus Christ, His death, His resurrection for our sins. Why is John often called the disciple of love? Or why is the term love associated with John? Because this is what he is talking about. Love for God. For having made that means of atonement available to us, who were once wretched, miserable sinners, but now able to come before him through the blood of Christ. And not only that, as we sojourn in this world, we are exhorted to shun darkness, to love not the world, to love not the sins of the world, to love not the deeds of darkness. And yet, God has given us a way. If we say that we sin, we have no sin, we deceive ourselves. But when we do sin, if we do sin, God forbid that we should sin. When we do, we can come to Him in humility, in confession, in repentance. The kind of repentance that will say we will not turn back to sin again, asking the Lord to forgive us. And the blood of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, according to verse 9, He is faithful and just to forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And verse 10 ends with this, If we say we have not sinned, we make Him a liar, and His word is not in us. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. For if any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. First point we want to consider, our love and affinity for God for that finished work for us. So let not any setbacks in this physical world hold you back or cause you to stumble spiritually. And at the same time, knowing this precious message, take it, take it to those who are yet in darkness. You will have family members who are still unsafe. You will have friends and colleagues who do not know the gospel. Share that gospel, that precious love of God that brings eternal life to all who put their faith and trust coming to Him in humility, forgiveness of sins. Verse 16 goes on. 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 says, To love not the world. And then verse 16 goes on to explain, For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, and the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life, is not of the Father, but is of the world. So in chapter 1, John had already made it very clear. God is light and in Him is no darkness. So having this very clear contrast, the Apostle John now lays it out as clearly as, and as in greatest detail that he can possibly say. Verse 16, all that is in the world. Now what are these deeds of darkness? What are the inclinations that cause a sojourner to turn from the light of God towards darkness? There it is in verse 16. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. These are not of the Father. Verse 16 tells us very clearly, but they are of the world. So these are the things of darkness. And God is light in Him. There is no darkness at all. If you read the entire span of the Bible, from Genesis all the way to Revelation, you'll find that every known sin that you can draw out from the Bible is in direct relation to one of these things of the world, named, in first, named here in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16. It either has to do with the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, or the pride of life. The very first sin committed in the Garden of Eden well, we all know that, isn't it? Right? Remember what uh, the, the Bible tells us? When the woman saw in Genesis chapter, six verse, chapter 3, verse 6, when the woman saw that a tree was good for food, it was pleasant to the eyes, and a tree to be desired to make one wise, she took of the fruit thereof and did eat and gave also unto her husband with her. Good for food. Lust of the flesh. Pleasant to the eyes. Lust of the eyes. Desire to make one wise. The pride of life. The very first sin. So when John wrote, and make it very clear, these are the three things you've got to watch out for. 
These are the three things that would encompass or describe any sin that you can find in the Bible. Remember David, how he fell into the sin of adultery? The last of the flesh, last of the eyes. Right? He shouldn't be standing there looking around. Remember how he went on to have Uriah murdered in the battlefield? What was that? Pride. He was a king. Right? It would be shameful if it had been found that Uriah was at battle. And, well, he would be traced and found the culprit. Pride. Look at any sin. Pick any sin in the Bible. Gehazi, remember that servant of Elisha? How he coveted after wealth right? and the material that Naaman, the general of Syria, had brought. He went after it, became a leper, cursed. Why? Last of the flesh, he wanted the material. <clears throat> Last of the eyes, he saw it, it was good. Pride, pride. It wasn't enough for him to be a humble servant of a prophet. He wanted a little more than that. Yeah. So the Bible is very clear. So as we sojourn on this world, this world is not our home. Because the Apostle John, when he wrote verse 16, actually he makes a very important clarification phrase. And that phrase is found in verse 16. For all that is in the world. You see that phrase, in the world? The last of the flesh, the last of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father but is of the world. Again, the same phrase is repeated. He wants us to understand. He wants the reader to understand. These are the things that you must shun. You must shun. So brothers and sisters, as we sojourn on this world, remember this. The Bible makes it very clear. Love not the world. And love not the world doesn't mean you hate the people in the world. right? Because God... Right, in all his love, gave his only begotten son. The Bible tells us God so loved the world. But love not the world in the sense, and this is John's clarification, do not love those things that will cause you to sin. Do not love those things that will cause you to sin the sins of the flesh. Do not love the things of the world that will cause your eyes to be attracted and therefore make your heart covetous and envious. Do not love the things of the world that would puff you up with pride. For indeed, if you exalt yourself, you may and you brought and you would have brought blasphemy right, upon God. For none is to be worshipped but God alone. This is how it is put across to us. As we are sojourners, we must be very, very aware that this is the way. Now, these things are of the world. These things are of the world. Verse 16 tells us, right? In fact, two phrases. All that is in the world. All that is in the world. So if you look at the world, apart from that which is spiritual and that which is godly, that God has instituted, there is a system that continues to promote the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, and the pride of life. And who is behind this system? The Bible also tells us, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 1, and you he hath quickened who were dead in trespasses and sin. Well, God hath quickened us, made us alive. We were once in trespasses and sins, but now we are quickened. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 1 now. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 2 says this, Wherein in times past ye walk according to the cause of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that worketh in the children of God disobedience. Let me just say that verse again, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 2, wherein in the time past, when time passed, he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So what are the things mentioned in 1 John chapter 2, verse 16 that is associated with with the prince of the power of the air and the children of disobedience, lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, pride of life. Who is behind it? Who is the one that's promoting this system and causing men and women to fall into sin? Time and again, from the very beginning of creation, all the way to the end times, none other than the prince of the power of the air. 
in other parts of the Bible, and you find the writers such as Paul will refer to him as what? The God of this world. The God of this world. He deceives. And he deceives the people in the world by the traits that have been described in verse 16. Lust. Flesh, eyes, and pride. So, the very sojourners as pilgrims, as strangers, let us walk mindful of this. If we love the world, the love of the Father is not in us. If we love the world, the things of the world, the Bible tells us very clearly is not of the Father. So we are at enmity with the world. The world meaning the things that are described in verse 16. The flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride. We are at enmity with that because they, these things are not of the Father. Now, the Lord Jesus overcame all these temptations. We see and we know that, right? That's described for us in the gospel. Because when the devil tempted him in Matthew chapter 4, how he tempted him with asking to turn the stone to bread, last of the flesh. He asked the Lord Jesus if he would what, throw or, or look at the nations of the world and bow down to worship, and he will give him the nations of the world. Last of the eyes. And finally, the pride of life. Throw yourself off the tower. Right? God will preserve you. And people will marvel at you. In our lives, in our daily walk, let us be mindful that these things mentioned in verse 16 are things that we should be very cautious and watchful against. Now, why? For instance, a young man or a young woman starting out in a career, right? And we were all there once before, we know, right? You've gone to your education, you've gotten your first job, first career. What do you want to do? You want to work hard, you want to build for yourself a good reputation in the industry or the sector you're in, isn't it? For your diligence. And this is by itself not a wrong thing. But be very watchful, brothers and sisters, because that can draw you away. <clears throat> It can draw you away as a matter of pride of life. <clears throat> yes. Because that idea that people will heap upon you honours and awards and praise will come to you and you are drawn in that direction. But that is not all. Because as the rewards come in and you find that you are moving along well in your career or in your business or in whatever field you are in, the rewards and the remuneration will increase. And then you get this feeling, right, that you would want more. Because why? You may have a better house now, a bigger house, a bigger car. You may have more commitments, or you may have extended your commitments over the time. What does it become? The lust of the flesh. All the things that fulfill your earthly pleasures, you want to have them. And the pride of life, together with the lust of the flesh. But then, a bigger and, and worse right, temptation will come in now that you grow in your career or in, in, in whatever area that you're in and you're acknowledged to be reputable and good. That becomes not sufficient to fulfill your inner desires. And then you know what? It now becomes the last of the eyes because you want more and you may even envy others who are more successful than you. Be very, very watchful. And I speak this as a matter of having gone through life, decades. And I know in my youth I have made some mistakes, certainly. And with those, that kind of experience, I can only come humbly before God because God says if we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And say, no, we never want to make that mistake again. And we'll teach others in order that they don't make that mistake. They will walk along the path as a sojourner. Their hearts with love for God. And when they look at the things of the world, they will shun. They will love not the world. They will make enmity with the world or the things in the world. You know, in, uh, in John chapter 2 verse 1, in First John chapter 2 verse 1, the Apostle Paul wrote this, My little children, these things I write unto you, that ye sin not. 
And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. You see, as the Apostle John goes through this epistle and he's encouraging them to shun the world and to continue walking close to God in love, right, with their hearts directed and their love directed towards God, being in fellowship with God in light, not in darkness. He's also mindful that the believer is grappling with temptations. For the prince of this world will not let up, and he will, he will tempt. So John time, the Apostle John time and again will warn the believer, if you are at enmity with this world, the devil will do his very best to cause you to fall. But these things write unto you, verse, chapter 2, verse 1, that ye sin not, that you sin not. You continue to pray that God's Holy Spirit will lead and guide you, lead you away from sin, which is our prayer, isn't it? Right? That we do not fall into evil and temptation. And if any man sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. The Lord Jesus Christ intercedes for us. So we do not fall into sin. We can shun, powered by the Holy Spirit, moved by the Holy Spirit. We look upon the things of the world and we are given that power and that guidance of the Holy Spirit to shun it. Why? Because the warning is very clear. All that is in the world is not of the Father, but it's of the world. We continue to shun it. And how do we know that God's Spirit will lead and guide us? Well, other epistles point us towards that. Romans chapter 8, verse 14, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, they are the sons of God. As many as are led by the Spirit of God, moved by the Spirit, guided by the Spirit, you are the sons of God. And the Holy Spirit will help us to draw away from those, assets, those things that would cause us to be tempted and to fall. Make this your prayer every day brothers, sisters, young men or young woman who's listening to this, before you start your work day, pray, Father in heaven, help me. Help me that I do not fall into the lust of the flesh. Because your flesh can be very deceptive. It will draw you and cause you to want to look at things or go towards places where you can fall in sin. So pray, God help me. If you are going and now, with MCO, there's very little travel. We know with the restricted movement of the pandemic. But if you ever have to travel, pray. God, help me. Before every trip, help me to watch and be guarded against the lust of the eyes. That the things I see do not cause me to be inclined and be drawn closer to sin. And if you are successful, and some of you are, I know. In fact, if you work hard, chances are you will turn out well. Make that your prayer every day. God, help me. Help me that I do not fall prey to the pride of life. And why do I make this emphasis about prayer? Because as Christians, we often have a kind of a, a, a view of separation between what we do as our work in the world and what we see as service in the church. But in fact, when God views us, we are a spiritual son of God or child of God or a daughter of God. So every aspect of our life is meant to be spiritual. So even when you get that promotion at your workplace, remember, pray, God help me not to be proud. Don't let this go to my head. If you're a servant of God, well, people like you know, myself who's teaching, preaching the word of God, we have been warned many, many times do not let encouragement and praises go to your head. Somebody said, oh, that's a good and very encouraging uh, sermon you have preached. Well, don't let that go to your head. Right? Know and understand that the prince of this world is ever ready to cause you to fall. If not by the lust of the flesh, then by the lust of the eyes. And if not that, by the pride of life. And remember God has a way. God has a way for us by confessing our sins. Now, knowing this, that our love and affinity is towards God, and knowing this, that the Bible tells us not to love the things of the world, 
What is it that continues to keep us? And verse 17 says that the world passes away and the last thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. He that doeth the will of God. Who is he that doeth the will of God? Remember the parable by the Lord Jesus Christ? Who is the man that is wise and builded his house upon a rock? He's a man who does the will of God. Right? Founded, his faith is founded upon the Lord Jesus Christ. His life is guided by the word of God. The world passes away and the last thereof, but the will, he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. What is it that abides forever? The one that is continuing and abiding in the will of God. How do we know the will of God? It's right here in our hands. The word of God instructs us and teaches us how we ought to live this life. So as a sojourner, we know that we direct our love towards God, that we may continue in fellowship with Him. We know that we love not the things of the world in order that we do not, do not fall into sin and temptation. Thirdly, we love the Word of God because from it, we are instructed in the will of God for our lives and therefore we sojourn according to that will that God has shown us. The lust of this world, on the other hand, verse 17 makes very clear, will pass away. It says in verse 17, the world passeth away and the lust thereof. So this world around us, this temporal world, in the book of Revelation, it tells us it will be burned up by fire. It will go. In fact, even before that, if the Lord tarries, we know that our very stay on earth, our sojourn, has a finite duration. We are not here on earth forever. Right? Three score and ten, it, by reason of strength, four score years. So all that is in the world, that will pass away. So the things that men and women lust for that are in the world, that will pass away too. That lust has no meaning and no relevance at all in the future when this world is burned up. Think about it. Somebody loves, for instance, to live in a big palatial house, nice big house, wonderful house, right? Living room the size of a banquet hall, swimming pool in the backyard, right? All sorts of facilities and wonderful amenities to live in. Well, someday, all of that's going to burn up. Some may desire awards and honours of men. Getting degrees and getting the praise of men for illustrious, excellent work in research, perhaps. Or perhaps in your industry. Very high recognition. Men will exalt you and praise you and give you great honours, give you titles. A fellow of such and such society, a very highly regarded title. Or men may heap upon you titles of the world, right? Lordships of kind. Or perhaps even in your own small way, in, your, in the enterprise or the company that you work for, a promotion. Right? A promotion, a team leader, a manager, whatever that may be. When this world is burned up, all of that will have no meaning. As we stand in eternity and we look back and we think to ourselves, at one point, I wished, I wished so dearly I had gotten that promotion in my job. Did it make sense? Does it, will that make sense? Looking at the span of eternity, knowing that this world will burn up? Well, or standing in eternity before God, we look back and say, oh, I wish I had that nice house in that very nice district. You know, what a wonderful house it will, will be to live in with a high ceiling and a marble floor and all that knowing that all this world will burn up. The last thereof is meaningless. And so verse 17 is very clear. Let me read for you. The world passeth away and the last thereof finished. No use. The things that the person would lust for that are in this world, totally meaningless. But what is meaningful is this. He that doeth the will of God and this man will abide forever. This is the man, the Lord Jesus Christ, who built his house upon the rock. 
the sojourner, who will find at the end of life's journey that heavenly city, that heavenly city that was desired for by the faithful, by Abraham, by Isaac, by Jacob, by the great men of faith that are named in Hebrews chapter 11, and women of faith, right? Rahab, Sarah, and all those men of faith, Gideon, Samson, and all that have put their faith in trust, not in the things of this world, but in the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. So let this be our message to encourage ourselves, firstly. Secondly, to strengthen our hearts and our resolve to serve God by sharing this message also with those who are still in darkness. Because remember what we read? God is light, and in Him there is no darkness at all. So for someone to come into the light and to enjoy the love and the fellowship of God, he must be reconciled through the blood and atonement of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And for that, you and I are the instruments who can bring the gospel of knowledge, of love, of salvation of God in Jesus Christ to them, to those that are lost. So may this message encourage us, strengthen us, and continue to help us on our earthly sojourn. Right? Remember this, number one, our love for God. Direct our love for God and continue walking in fellowship with Him. Number two, love not the world. Those things that will cause sin are of the prince of this world. Let us shun those things. And finally, knowing the will of God, knowing the word of God to do His will. That is the thing that calls us and help us or make us to be the ones that abideth forever according to the word of God. Amen. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank thee for thy precious word. We pray that thy word will continue to lead and guide thy people, strengthen them, lead, guide them, and help them, Lord, along life's journey, that together we may rejoice in the day, Lord, when we see of thy glory. We pray and thank thee in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Thank God for this time together. There are some discussion questions if you uh, would look at the display. Uh, may the Lord bless you and keep you.